I'm very too happy to welcome you this evening to our webinar that's trying to explore the question, what is the European stimulus, economic stimulus program, next generation EU doing for women? Are women being left out? My name is Alexandra Geze. I'm a member of the Green Group and I'm a member of the European Parliament, of the Budget Committee and of the Committee for Internal Market and Consumer Protection. And in the Budget Committee, I'm the Standing Rapporteur for Gender Budgeting. And that's why I'm particularly interested in the topic. This, I uh, will start with some, house, with some housekeeping. This webinar is going to be interpreted in three languages. We have English as an original, and then we will have interpretation into German and into Italian. So I will do the housekeeping in three languages. If you need interpretation, you find a little sign with the globus with a little world on the right side of your screen below the below the images of the people you are seeing you have to click on that and then you have the choice of languages you can choose english german or korean but korean is italian so if you're looking for italian please click on korean if you are using a smaller device, like a phone, for example, or um, like a tablet, you probably find interpretation under the three dots. You have to click on the three, three dots and then you go to interpretation. And now don't log off. I'm going to repeat these remarks in German and in Italian, first in Italian and then in German. Uh, buonasera, mi fa molto piacere dare il benvenuto a tutte, a tutte. Parliamo questa sera del pacchetto di incentivi economici del Recovery Fund che l'Unione Europea ha preparato o sta preparando per superare questa grave crisi economica e ci stiamo chiedendo cosa farà per le donne. Se cercate la traduzione in italiano, perché io dopo ricontinuerò a parlare in inglese come la maggior parte delle persone qua su questo panel, dovete andare in basso sul vostro schermo, in basso a destra trovate un piccolo simbolo del mondo cliccate lì e trovate le lingue e lì dovete scegliere per avere l'italiano dovete scegliere il coreano eh, ci dispiace non è colpa nostra è colpa di zoom che ancora non è previsto l'italiano lo so che lo stanno implementando ma ancora questa versione con l'italiano non funziona molto bene ma da noi funziona tutto benissimo basta che andate sul coreano se state utilizzando un dispositivo più piccolo Trovate ehm, la stessa opzione, probabilmente in alto a destra ci sono i tre puntini, cliccate sui tre puntini, poi scegliete interpretazione e sempre coreano. E adesso ripeterò questo in tedesco e poi ripasserò in inglese, quindi siate pazienti. Ja, einen wunderschönen guten Abend. Ich begrüße Sie alle ganz herzlich zu unserem Webinar, das sich mit der Frage beschäftigt, was äh, der europäische Wiederaufbaufonds Next Generation EU für Frauen tut oder eben auch nicht tut. Mein Name ist Alexandra Gese. Ich bin grünes Mitglied im Europäischen Parlament und im Haushaltsausschuss und ich möchte Ihnen zunächst einmal erklären, wie Sie die deutsche Verdolmetschung weiter hören können, wenn ich wieder Englisch sprechen werde. Dazu haben Sie unten rechts auf Ihrem Bildschirm einen kleinen Globus, auf den Sie klicken können und dort können Sie dann die Sprache einstellen und ähm, können sich dann Deutsch aussuchen, wenn Sie den Rest des Webinars auf Deutsch hören möchten. Wenn Sie ein kleineres Gerät benutzen, wie ein Smartphone oder ein Tablet zum Beispiel, dann finden Sie die gleiche Option wahrscheinlich oben rechts unter den drei Punkten, einfach auf die drei Punkte klicken und dann müsste es eine äh, Option geben, die Verdolmetschung oder Übersetzung heißt und dort können Sie wiederum die Sprache einstellen und ich werde jetzt noch mal Englisch sprechen. So, here I am, back in English. Um, we will later have the possibility, you will have the possibility to ask questions because this is a very interactive debate. It's not just us here on the screen debating with each other, but we want to speak about you, speak with you about the results of our study. <laughs> and if you have any questions, you can write them in the Q&A. You see a little symbol down below the screen that says um, Q&A and you can open that and write the questions. Please use it only if you really have questions to ask, which we're supposed to read out. If you have any other comments on what's going on, please, or technical questions, please use the chat. Um, if you want to ask a question uh, speaking directly, discussing directly with us, you have to click um, to go to participants, look for your name, which is probably on top, and there you click on raise hand, and we can see that, that you're waiting to speak, and later we will call you. 
I'll just repeat that in German and Italian to make sure everybody has found their channel. Bene, spero che adesso abbiate trovato tutto il canale per l'interpretazione. Se non fosse così, andate in basso a destra, interpretazione, scegliete la lingua. Se volete dopo partecipare attivamente al nostro dibattito, potete o scrivere nel Q&A, aprite quello, scrivete una domanda dentro e se faccio in tempo dopo la leggerò, altrimenti andate su partecipanti. Se volete intervenire oralmente, avete anche poi la possibilità di discutere direttamente con noi, andate su partecipanti. Eh, cliccate sul vostro nome e poi in basso trovate eh, alza la mano, trovate il simbolo con una manina che potete cliccare. So, und das Ganze nochmal auf Deutsch. Wir haben hier heute eine sehr interaktive Debatte, das heißt, Sie haben die Möglichkeit, Fragen zu stellen, indem Sie auf Q und A unten klicken und Ihre Frage da reinschreiben, damit ich sie nachher vorlesen kann, wenn wir dafür Zeit haben. Oder Sie können mündlich äh, fragen, dazu müssen Sie auf Teilnehmer gehen und sehen dann, Unten die Möglichkeit, die Hand zu heben. Das ist eine Meldung und wir werden dann nachher die Meldung entgegengeben. Okay, I hope everybody has found translation. Otherwise, Anna is going to keep the information on this in the chat. And um, yeah, so we can start. Um, we would like um, to start, before I introduce the topic, I would like to give um, the floor to a guest of honor that we have this evening, is Kimia, because he has to leave early, so it's other important things to do in Greece. He's, I think he's, you're joining from Greece, aren't you? Dimitris Papadimoulis is Vice President of the European Parliament and he's responsible for gender equality and diversity and he's Chairman of the High Level Group on Gender Equality and Diversity. He's a member of the GUA Party in the European Parliament and I'm very happy that he's going to address us before we start with the topic. Dimitris, you have the floor. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity that you are giving to me. Uh, sorry, but I have to leave early because I have another obligation just the same uh, time. Uh, I think that it's a very good opportunity to share some thoughts. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic has exposed many of the structural problems that the European Union is still facing. European citizens have witnessed a very grave lack of coordination and solidarity. The virus tested the healthcare and welfare system of several member states, our societies, our economies, and our way of living and working together. The overwhelming majority during that crisis recognized the importance of public health services. There has been a wave of solidarity in every country reflected by people uniting to pay tribute to health workers, as well as to demand the strengthening of public health services throughout the EU. The next generation EU plan, if used effectively, can alleviate many of the consequences of the pandemic that workers are already paying. A key element, however, will be the imposition of conditionalities to the availability of these resources. Unfortunately, I have to say as chair of the high level working group on equality, that women are hardly mentioned in the plan and no clear gender targeted measures have been proposed so far. This is the key point for our debate. And it is very important that the EU ensures that equality is at the heart of the recovery plan. A prosperous and social Europe irrespective of sex, racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation is vital for economic and social progress as it is enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. This is all the more important in a crisis which had, has had disproportionate impact on a number of vulnerable groups in our society. Safeguarding that all workers in the EU earn a decent living would be essential for the economic recovery in order to truly be effective. Given women are overrepresented and underpaid in many frontline jobs, the need to close the gender pay gap 
through binding pay transparency measures and gender targeted economic stimulus via a clear roadmap becomes, becomes all the more significant. I'm also a member of the budget committee and of the high level contact group of the European Parliament, which represent the Parliament in the negotiations with the Council and the Commission. And I think that the results of the webinar, that the webinar will be very useful to our efforts as a European Parliament to include uh, women as a very important dimension of that uh, next generation EU plan. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm sure that that mm -hmm. webinar will be very useful and uh, I'm uh, ready to uh, communicate with you uh, about the results of that debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. And we, we'll count on you on what is coming in the future in the negotiations with council. And you know, we're colleagues in the budget committee, so I think we'll have a common battle there. I'm sorry, but I have to leave immediately. I know we, okay. we all have the same problem. Okay. Yeah. It's still right. working. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, so I would like to make a few remarks as an introduction before we see the presentation of the study in order to explain you how we got here, how we started all this. Yeah, and friend. I would like to say that at the beginning of the crisis, um, there was, at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, we stood in shock, in fear. But then after a few weeks, from a women's point of view, there was hope as well. Because for the first time, women's work that had always been essential for the first time was really recognized and seen as essential. Women's work in the health sector especially, but also in the supermarket, it was appreciated, it was applauded on balconies, and it was lauded in every and each political meeting. And there was hope. That, uh, that would lead to a better thinking, to a new thinking, to a better appreciation, and above all, to a better remuneration of women's work. But then that dream was shattered quickly. Because what happened? First of all, with children and sick family members at home, women's working hours, and I'm speaking not about the paid working hours, I'm speaking about the unpaid working hours, increased. The lucky ones could work at home, endless hours at night, because everybody who has had a toddler knows you can't work and take care of children at the same time. You can't cook three meals a day and keep children playing, studying, and work at the same time. It's just not possible. That's additional hours. It's not a solution. And those, as I said, were the lucky ones. The unlucky ones lost their jobs because they had to quit because somebody needs to take care of children. Think of single parents. Obviously, all, also all the women who lost their jobs, and we get to that later. And women had a special, especially high risk of infection because they kept working in the sectors that were particularly exposed. Think of the health sector where 80% are women. Think of supermarkets that took weeks and weeks to have um, their staff equipped with masks and with separation walls and so on. Then there was the second fact that's important to see unemployment skyrocketed in what are called the, the client-facing sectors. So those sectors of the economy where people deal with people. And that's typically in our gender segregated labor market, those are women's jobs. Retail trade, as we said before, health, education, tourism, restaurants, hotels, therapy, those were all the parts of the economy that completely shut down, those were women's jobs. And what was the conclusion we saw at first sight? Well, we need more resilient schools and childcare services, and we need to focus on women for the economic recovery. And as the vice president of the European Parliament said before, economic stimulus progress, the programs should put gender equality at its core. But then there was a bad surprise. 
neither the member states nor the European Union seem to share that opinion. That to me was perfectly obvious because we saw economic stimulus programs being prepared in almost every member state. And we saw this huge program prepared by the European Union. The Council has to decide on in July next month, in a few days practically, that don't even mention women. They just completely overlook them. I, I was shocked and I got really, really angry. So I started to talking to a lot of women and I started a petition and this petition is called half of it. And you can still sign it. It's on WeMove. I think Anna is going to post the link in the chat or she already has. So look for half of it on WeMove and please sign my petition. We are asking that 50% of all the funds of the economic stimulus programs are dedicated to women. And there you can read in the text of the petition how exactly this is going to happen. But that was not enough. Being a member of part of the European Parliament, obviously, I have to try to do more than just uh, post petitions. And we wanted some evidence because to me it was obvious, but to other people it was not. And it's important to the evidence based politics. So I asked my group, the Greens Effort group that always supports, strongly supports feminism, I asked them to uh, commission a gender impact assessment of next generation EU of this huge economic stimulus program of the European Union. And uh, my group did. And here we are today to present the results of this gender impact assessment. So of this great study that looks into what next generation EU is going to do for women or not going to do, unfortunately. So if I can anticipate a little bit the results. So here we are today to speak about the results of the study. And I'm very happy to welcome my guests. They're first of all, the two researchers that have uh, worked enormously during weekends, late at night. Um, I, can, I can testify this. They are Dr. Elisabeth Klatzer. She's a researcher, an activist, and a consultant from Austria. Happy to have you tonight. She has many years of experience in the field of budgetary and economic policies, feminist economics and gender budgeting. She's a co-founder of the European Gender Budgeting Networks and Fund Fiscal, a civilist Austrian, civil society Austrian network, which, which fights for gender neutral budgets and taxes in Austria. And then we have from Italy, because we wanted people from different countries to reflect um, the different views from different parts of Europe. Um, professor Azzurra Rinaldi from, from Italy. She's a professor of economics of emerging countries at Unitalma Sapienza University of Rome. And um, she has a lot of experience, especially in the field of development economics, international cooperation, worked in many national and international projects focused upon development, microcredit and emerging countries, but knows quite a lot about also the development of uh, developed economies and of gender budgeting. So they are here today to discuss the study with me in the first 20 minutes, uh, the following 20 minutes, not the first 20 minutes anymore, unfortunately, in the following 20 minutes of our webinar. I would like to briefly introduce um, our, my other guests who are um, Jessica and Goyen from the European Women's League, because when I prepared the petition, um, we got a lot of support and we coordinated a lot with the European Women's League, which is, and maybe you can introduce yourself later when you speak in the European Women's League, but it's a great association of women's associations all over Europe and uh, a great resource for us. And I'm very happy to have her here today. Then we have, um, for me, it was very important to have uh, colleagues from the pro-European democratic political groups in the European Parliament. And I'm very happy to welcome Francis Fitzgerald from the EPP group. Um, we don't know each other yet, but I noted her in plenary because she was one of the very, very few women always to stand up for gender budgeting and for women's rights. And that was duly noted. And I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight from, from Ireland. And um, you've been a minister in Ireland, very important figure of your party. I'm very happy to have you here. Then we are still waiting for Pina Picciano. Pina Picciano is not yet here because she has party affairs to tend to as well, like Dimitrios um, 
that's our, our destiny as politicians, but she would come in by eight o'clock. Um, she represents the S&D, she's from Italy, a very outspoken um, advocate of women's rights in her countries, and she supported half of it and now at a very early stage and disseminated it a lot in Italy. And I have to say, she got a lot of bad comments, a lot of hate speech, and she's a very outspoken woman, and we'll be happy to have her in a few minutes. And in the meantime, we already have Samira Raffaella from the Renew Group. Welcome to you, Samira, colleague from the Italian, from the European Parliament. And we already had the pleasure to collaborate a little bit on artificial intelligence and women's rights in, in that area. So I'm very happy to have you all and to be able to discuss with you later. So how are we going to proceed? We'll take 20 minutes. I will ask Azura and Elizabeth, Azura Rinaldi, Elizabeth Klatzer, a few questions in order to present the results of the study. Then everybody else will have a few minutes to comment on that, and then you can come in with your questions. Um, so where are my questions? Here are. Start with Elizabeth. Why, Elizabeth? why does the European Union have to protect women's rights? Isn't that something the member states have to do? Why is that our issue? And um, what does the recovery fund has to do with this? Why, why is this our task? Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexandra, distinguished members of uh, the European Parliament, I'm very uh, happy to be part of this as it's a very important initiative. So uh, as we have a limited time, I, write, I want to come right to this question. Uh, so why are we talking about uh, promoting women's rights and uh, what is uh, the obligation? So the first point is there is clear treaty obligations, for example, Article 8 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which explicitly says and calls for in all its activities, the Union. It doesn't say member states, but the union shall aim to eliminate inequalities and to promote equality between women and men. There is many more provisions. I won't go through it. Uh, don't worry. But just to highlight also Article 23 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which specifically says, uh, again, equality, including employment, work and pay. So there is clear treaty obligations for all institutions of the European Union. And then there is, of course, fortunately, the new gender equality strategy presented by the Commission this year, a union of equality, which reiterates all the obligations and specifically says the inclusion of a gender perspective in all EU policies and processes is essential to reach the goal of gender equality. So, and we have the gender equality strategy with a series of priorities like driving in a gender equal economy, closing gender gaps, also closing the gender care gap, et cetera. I, again, I can't mention everything, but clear commitments to making progress and a clear notion of what is necessary in terms of the approach. So in the gender equality strategy, there again is the underlining of a dual approach needed, targeted measures to achieve uh, gender equality combined with a full strategy of strengthening gender mainstreaming. Uh, well, um, so what does that have to do with the recovery fund, you asked Alexandra? Um, it's not only this underlining of gender equality in all activities, but as an economist, I have to say that including macroeconomic policies and budgetary policies is a must if you want to uh, have a thriving economy and work towards gender equality, because if we have gender blind uh, proposals, as we will see, this is uh, the EU recovery plan is not living up to, to these obligations. If we have such 
uh, gender blind proposals. This is not only not achieving gender equality, but it is inefficient from an economic perspective. It's an inefficient um, use of money. It's an ineffective use of money. And we have all the instruments here, which is gender budgeting, use of gender equality, mainstreaming in budgetary and uh, fiscal policies and in the recovery plan, which would own the stimulus plan would only work if it fully integrates uh, gender equality. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Happens to everybody doing video conference the whole day and then uh, forgetting to unmute myself. Um, yeah, and then um, so let's come to the economic impact. Um, and I would like to ask Azura. Who wants to post to wants to share her screen? I suppose. So I would like Elizabeth to unshare her screen. Azura, I said that the economic impact of the crisis is harder on women than on men. Did you found any evidence for this fear of mine? Is that so? Why and why is it so? Ma um, sì, sì, Alexandra. In realtà, quello che noi abbiamo visto è che l'impatto economico della crisi, come accennava anche il vicepresidente prima, è un impatto che viene esercitato in misura maggiore su quei settori che noi diremmo relazionali, che sono appunto quei settori nei quali noi troviamo un volume maggiore di donne eh, rispetto agli uomini. Um, I would just like to recall to everybody where to find interpretation because maybe some people expect to only listen to English the whole time. So yeah, or, or, or we, we could also speak in English. No, no, you're, it's perfectly fine in Italian. I just want to make sure everybody finds translation. Um, so you go on the little world below your screen, interpretation, and then you choose the language you want, probably English. Or if you have a smaller device, it's the three dots, and then you find interpretation and the right language. So we give everybody 10 seconds to switch language, and you go ahead in Italian, Azzurra. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so, so maybe we can start again. Okay, I, I will switch to Italian. <laughs> um, sì, quello che abbiamo visto dall'analisi dei dati è che i settori più colpiti eh, da questa crisi, che è una crisi molto diversa rispetto a quella che noi abbiamo osservato anche nel 2009, è una crisi che noi tendiamo a sovrapporre alla crisi del 2009, in realtà ha delle caratteristiche molto differenti anche in termini di mercato del lavoro. Ecco perché questa analisi è così importante, perché altrimenti rischiamo di rifarci a dei dati che in realtà sono profondamente differenti. Quello che noi abbiamo visto è che questi sono i settori più colpiti, sono settori appunto, come diceva eh, anche il vicepresidente del Parlamento europeo, sono settori a prevalente occupazione femminile. Eh, sono quei settori cosiddetti relazionali. Io vorrei un attimo condividere il mio schermo. Ok. Uh, questi sono i settori prevalenti, uh, i settori più colpiti dalla crisi derivata dal coronavirus. Um, questi sono settori che sono relativi all'istruzione, come vediamo, alla uh, salute e ai lavori sociali, a tutto il settore che negli Stati Uniti si chiama Oreca, quindi il settore della ristorazione, uh, del turismo, dell'accommodation e così via. Nel quarto pilastro vediamo il settore dell'arte, eh, cultura e tutte le attività cosiddette di leisure e poi abbiamo il eh, settore dei servizi domestici. All'interno di ciascuna barra noi vediamo la quota di occupazione, fatto 100 il totale, quota di occupazione femminile e quota di occupazione maschile. Vediamo l'occupazione femminile in rosso, l'occupazione, la percentuale di occupazione maschile in verde. Quindi vediamo che a prescindere dal settore di accommodation, and food and services, diciamo i settori del leisure e uh, as culture and recreation, 
sui quali comunque abbiamo dati che ehm, sfuggono un po' perché in realtà abbiamo anche un settore sommerso che non coglie esattamente, eh, ma per il resto, come vediamo, sono settori appunto a prevalente eh, occupazione femminile. Eh, quello che ci interessa qui sottolineare inoltre è che, eh, come anticipavi anche tu Alexandra, ehm, qui c'è un problema non solo nel qui e ora, cioè nella situazione che stiamo fotografando noi adesso, ma c'è un problema proprio anche in termini di prospettiva strategica e questo è il problema che noi chiediamo alla politica poi di risolvere. No? Eh, cioè il problema è che ad esempio parlo per il mio paese, in Italia dove già prima della crisi c'era un 27% di donne lavoratrici che lasciava il lavoro dopo il primo figlio, adesso già sappiamo che dopo la crisi avremo un drop out lavorativo che si stima, se non ci sarà una seconda ondata, intorno al 20-25%, quindi madri lavoratrici che lasceranno il lavoro a causa del Covid. Perché? perché con le scuole chiuse sono obbligate a, in qualche modo, a eh, prendersi cura eh, dei figli. E dal momento che la giornata è chiaramente un gioco a somma zero, se si dedica tanto tempo all'attività di cura, e eh, tu dicevi effettivamente chi ha dei bambini piccoli, io ne ho tre, ho tre bambine piccole, quindi rientro perfettamente nella casistica, eh, è, è difficilissimo, quindi ci si ritrova a lavorare la notte, ci si trova a lavorare comunque in condizioni di grande... Eh, fatica. Questo è un problema in realtà che noi vediamo anche in Germania. Eh, in Germania c'è l'Institute of Economic and Social Research che ci dice che eh, già adesso il 27% delle madri lavoratrici eh, tedesche ha dovuto ridurre il proprio orario di lavoro per prendersi cura eh, dei bambini e delle bambine a fronte del 16% dei padri, quindi chiaramente abbiamo un problema. Ma nuovamente questo è un problema di efficienza, nel senso che in questo momento, che è un momento congiunturale di crisi, e eh, le proiezioni sono delle proiezioni molto pesanti eh, no? di contrazione del prodotto interno lordo, questo è il momento in cui noi ci aspettiamo che le misure di politica economica mirino a far esplodere il pieno potenziale di tutte le donne e gli uomini che sono in grado di creare ricchezza. Thank you very much, Azura. So uh, my question is, we, we need the potential of everybody who's able to create value, as Azura said. Elizabeth, does Next Generation EU acknowledge the problem? Does it put women into the situation that they really can tap all their potential on the labor market? What is Next Generation EU doing for women? Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, well, this is the big question. Let me say first, uh, as we don't have enough time to, to really go into all the results, uh, we, have, we had to put the subtitle to our study, The Next Generation EU Leaves Women Behind. It sounds harsh, but actually that's what we are finding. There is massive amounts, as we know, there is money needed, of course, massive amounts invested, mobilized, but in a largely gender-blind way. There is, uh, and we have heard uh, very well from actually Alexandra, you started, and now Asura has shown us the effects and where money would be needed. But that's not where the money is going. We do not see a mobilization of funds to being uh, invested in reorganization of schools, childcare, and other forms of care, for example. We not, do not see the money to be invested in this to make a truly resilient economy which would be prepared for a new cri uh, for any new crisis that might come or give way to women to and full equality. We see a transition towards a digital and green economy, which in itself is important, but not enough, especially not enough if it's done in a gender blind way and if it has a gender bias in it. So remember Asura slides of the sectors which have been most hit uh, by the COVID crisis. 
that's very different with high, sorry, and Asura has mentioned the high um, shares of women being in these sectors. And the picture is very different if you look at the focus sectors of the EU recovery. You see here the five sectors that are in the recovery plan, especially mentioned and highlighted by Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, which is uh, investing in renewable energy, investing in transport, in digitalization, information communication, also food, agriculture, construction. And the one thing that actually is common here is overly high shares of male uh, employment. So we haven't seen any assessment, impact assessments by the Commission, but uh, there is a high tendency of uh, job creation in male dominated sectors. That's one of the many, or that these are some of the many aspects. We have analyzed selected uh, instrument and programs within the full uh, next generation EU. So I cannot talk about everything, but there is many big and smaller aspects. For example, there is in the Invest EU program, there is um, one of the policy windows is the, uh, designed to support SMEs, even though it is enlarged to all include companies up to 499 employees. Um, however, we know from all analysis in the credit market and banking that there is quite a bit of discrimination against women to be found when it comes to access to credits, but also discrimination in terms of credit conditions. That would be, of course, to uh, give uh, the same opportunities. It might make sense to uh, specify in the large InvestEU program with the guarantees to provide and make sure that women-led led enterprises have the same availability and access to money. So um, there would be a need and a good possibility to focus on that. Um, let me see, what else can I mention? For example, when we talk about the main program uh, mobilizing uh, money to be uh, devoted to member states uh, recovery, the European Recovery and Resilience Facility, which is linked to the European semester and the need for governments to present national recovery and resilience plans. There are strong powers given to the Commission, but there is no whatsoever criteria to both um, have member states include uh, gender equality in the uh, recovery and resilience plans or to have the European Commission in their assessment to promote um, the self-declared goals, for example, to make sure that financing towards the goals of gender equality is included. There is many other aspects. They are very different in degree. For example, if we talk about the Health for EU program, there we know that there is high um, male uh, dominated networks, which uh, in the health sector, there is not really a, a mechanism to make sure that women have possibilities to enter at the same time, uh, at the same level. Let me one last example mention, because I could talk for hours, but I know we don't have the time. However, if we talk about the social investment and skills policy window in the whole Invest EU program, that sounds great. That would be the, the place to finance the highly needed uh, care economy and transition towards care services we talk about. However, there is a few problems to it. It sounds great. It only gets less than 5% of the whole sum of the guarantee money of InvestEU. Plus, there is a possibility for the European Commission to even reduce it further as the Commission has the possibility to shift 15% of the funds from others to the strategic European investment window, which does not at all 
address gender issues and it's highly uh, biased towards large uh, companies. And by the way, towards financing defense, which is very surprising among others, of course, which is very surprising because this hasn't really been a, a, a sector which has been hit by, by Corona. Anyhow, we have the social investment win uh, window as small as it is, limited in size. But even then, with the small money, it's not making full use of investment as the specific objective for this window is not creating a resilient economy or strengthening the care economy, but to develop and consolidate a social investment market. So the question is, what are the main objectives and is it really reaching, especially in this um, sector as we have found in our studies that there, there, there might be some collusion between private in uh, investor interests and commissions setting up the proposal which is possibly more helping investment interests than the build-up of a care economy. Let me say a last point to stop with a positive example which is that in the invest eu there is some stipulations of uh, asking for gender balance in the commission of the key bodies which is not complete we can make the proposals even better to really have a strong um, uh, commitment and a strong requirement for gender balance in the bodies and we know it's not enough because it needs gender equality expertise for example to make sure that credits women and men equally access uh, credit so there's a lot of issues in it but it's a good start and you as legislators will have ample opportunities to strengthen gender perspectives in the proposals we will do our best uh, elizabeth i i just take a couple of the of the written questions in in between because they just fit i just saw a question that said is there any chance to bring this up with the german presidency and i did have the chance today to bring it up because i'm going to be the rapporteur for something called the technical support instruments where we will try to include an obligation or at least a financing line for gender impact assessments and gender budgeting and i brought it up with the um, the finance people of um, the german permanent representation who are working on this and I have to say, they looked a little bit puzzled in the first place, but after an hour of talking to them, I sort of got the promise that they're going to look into it and we'll look back into it after, after the European Council, when hopefully in July, everything will be decided. Somebody else is uh, saying, Brigitte Young is saying, um, you're speaking, you're, you're preaching to the converted. Um, Yes, um, have you tried to bring it across at a broader spectrum of economists, including males and the commissioners and so on? Yes, I brought this question up with Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni in a committee meeting. Um, so I asked what is, I, I explained the reasons behind and asked what is the fund doing for women and he sort of went blank for 30 seconds. And then he said, well, um, hmm, um, I don't know, we, yeah, there's a problem, you know, and then he came up with an answer, but there was no content because he couldn't, because there, there wasn't anything in there, as our researchers have found out. So, um, but I would like to come back to, um, to Elizabeth and to ask you, well, not everybody cares about gender equality and many, many people say well we have such a deep economic crisis and you're coming with gender equality what what's the point you know we have to foster employment and promote employment now and it's all about the economy so stop talking about gender equality but um the things you have observed what do they mean for employment and for the performance of next generation eu um Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me just briefly uh, uh, say something to what you mentioned now. I mean, I think it seems we really need to join forces. And as you mentioned, the uh, question by Brigitte Young, she, for example, is also an economist who has worked a lot on questions of discrimination in financial markets, uh, access to credit. So I guess that the task here is really to get out of the group of converted to make sure that everybody understands how much 
economic uh, sense it makes to include gender equality. And that comes to your, uh, uh, to your question. I mean, what we need is to use the scarce funds, even though there are many, they are still too little as we know. So we need to use that what is there as effectively and efficiently as possible. And uh, I have showed that the, sorry, I'm in the wrong side again before that uh, the money goes to certain sectors, which are not the sectors which will create, make most use of money when we talk about not only creating uh, more male jobs than female jobs, but also the question of where is most employment creation. And let me come to one uh, finding which we see, and here I cite a very important study by Jerome de Henau and Sue Himmelweit, who looked at the employment effects of the same amount of investments. Here, this is for, let's say, investing 2% of GDP, either in physical infrastructure, in construction, or in care. And what you see on the slide uh, is that um, for any country, here it's still EU 28, they did it, or other countries, Germany, Denmark, Spain, the overall employment gains for investing in care are at least the double rate than investing in physical infrastructure. So from an economic point of view, investing, using money wisely, it would mean investing in care as well. Of course, there's other priorities, but investing in, in care as well. The other finding, just to briefly mention it, is that when you see male and female jobs created, it's um, that also investing in care not only creates um, women's jobs, but also a large amount of male jobs, as you see. And depending on the country context, it might even be that investing in care creates the same amount of male jobs than in construction. As you see, for example, for Germany, where the green bars for the two uh, columns are the same size, plus in addition, you have the high uh, job creation uh, in addition for female employment. So um, that's the things that we need to talk about. But also, as we have talked about the rising inequalities, we know by now from studies from the European Institute for Gender Equality, but also internationally, that gender inequalities come at a high cost. So what we see is due to the inequalities uh, aggravated by COVID crisis, we, we might have a high cost in terms of additional GDP losses. Or said reversely, um, studies by IGA even uh, before COVID showed that um, the growth rates can be increased uh, by six to 9.6 uh, percentage points if we realize uh, gender equality. This is a calculation for up to 2050. It not only is growth um, rates increasing, but also employment rates, more jobs being created, up to an addition of six to 10 million jobs being created if women's employment rate was increased and not like we see signs now decreasing through COVID. So it makes a lot of sense to really think about using the money efficiently and rethinking some of the priorities and introducing a focus on gender equality, um, financing for gender equality priorities within the recovery fund, recovery plans in order to increase the effectiveness of economic stimulus. I stop here. I guess we have a chance to address many other issues in discussions. Yes, thank you. I hope so, especially this wonderful study, because um, as a moderator, I have just seen that the author of this great study um, is among the attendees. So if she felt like commenting on her study later, we would be very happy to listen to her. So just if you're interested in speaking up later and if you have time, um, please raise your hand. 
that's true for everybody else. Um, I'm receiving some written questions, quite a lot of them, but um, you can also um, show that you ask, ask for the floor and we will give you the floor later. So just use this little hand symbol in the participants menu and you'll be able to speak and to make our discussion even more interesting and more lively. Um, so, um, last question. We are here as policymakers, as politicians, as MEPs. Um, tell us, please, what to do. Azura, what are your policy recommendations? Yes, thank you. Do, do we need to repeat once more about how to get the interpretation services? Or shall we just... No, I think everybody has learned. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, io ritengo che cerchiamo di trasformarla in positivo, okay? perché chiaramente il quadro è attualmente eh, davvero sconfortante, no? non, non aver trovato nessuna menzione, nessuna struttura anche di eh, supporto eh, per le donne, pur sapendo, perché tutti gli studi ci dimostrano che le donne in questo momento stanno soffrendo di più, rischia di essere frustrante, no? Quindi, come dici tu, cerchiamo di invece cogliere le opportunità, che sono tutte da costruire, ovviamente. Che cosa possiamo fare? Io ritengo che la prima cosa che possiamo fare sia evitare di pensare che i problemi siano altri. Eh, perché altrimenti questa è la prima risposta, no? sono ben altri i problemi in questo momento, non è vero. Questo è uno dei problemi principali che noi abbiamo la possibilità, grazie a voi, no? di portare comunque all'attenzione e di cercare di risolvere in questo momento. È un problema di efficienza sempre, noi sappiamo dalla Commissione Europea che ogni anno la gender inequality costa all'Unione Europea eh, 370 miliardi di euro, quindi la gender inequality non è solo sbagliata da un punto di vista di equità, eh, su questo siamo tutti d'accordo, è un costo, okay? quindi se non fosse sufficiente l'argomentazione che dobbiamo andare verso l'uguaglianza, allora diciamo aggiungiamo un'ulteriore motivazione, la inequality, gender inequality ci costa. Quello che dobbiamo fare è chiederci, ma che cosa accade se il denaro viene collocato in una maniera non efficiente, che è quello che stiamo rischiando che accada adesso? Perché quello che vediamo è che eh, i settori, come eh, ci mostrava Elisabeth, eh, i settori che sono quelli che beneficeranno di più eh, dell'attuale pacchetto di misure di Next Generation, sono settori a prevalenza occupazionale maschile. Anche se noi sappiamo che, come abbiamo visto prima, che i settori invece in cui si perde di più il lavoro sono settori a prevalente occupazione femminile. E chiaramente questo è un problema perché dal momento che stiamo parlando di un ammontare importante di denaro, no? che è quello contenuto nelle misure, ad esempio, io come contribuente, che cosa mi aspetto? Che queste eh, misure riducano le disuguaglianze. Io mi aspetto che i miei soldi come contribuente vengano utilizzati per ridurre le disuguaglianze, non per aumentarle. E allora, eh, anche eh, come diceva Elisabeth, la creazione di lavoro, o come dicevi anche tu, Alexandra, che ha questo focus sicuramente apprezzabile sul digitale e sul green che è assolutamente condivisibile allo stesso tempo sappiamo da tutti i dati che questi sono settori prendiamo il digitale non è un settore in cui manchino i fondi è un settore in cui spesso non si trovano le risorse invece di persone che sono adeguatamente formate allora qui il problema non è soltanto non è tanto trasferire dei fondi. Il problema eventualmente è un problema di formazione, ma questi sono anche settori molto difficili in cui riqualificarsi. Cioè se noi pensiamo a una donna come me, una donna di mezza età, <ride> una donna che comunque non è, è giovane ma non è più giovanissima, eh, per me sarebbe impensabile riqualificarmi in un settore come questo d'amblè. Okay? 
Io credo che questo sia eh, il rischio maggiore che noi stiamo correndo in questo momento e credo che questo sia eh, il lavoro che noi anche ci aspettiamo da voi, perché il problema è che se non siamo efficienti eh, il denaro dei contribuenti in realtà viene utilizzato in modo da aumentare i costi anziché ridurli e quindi questa è secondo me l'attenzione che veramente bisogna porre eh, per poter utilizzare questo denaro, questa crisi anche eh, nella maniera più efficiente possibile per tutte e per tutti. Grazie mille. So, um, thank you all very much. Now it's the time for our other guests. We have seen the first results of the study. How would you comment on this? What do you think? And I keep inviting the attendees to raise their hands if they want to take the floor later. This is the great opportunity to speak to the researchers, to speak to politicians fighting for women's rights in the economic area. But we start with the European Women's Lobby and Jessica Nagoyan. Happy to have you here. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for having me. Uh, we've worked quite closely together in relation to the half of it petition and also previously uh, looking at the need for gender budgeting uh, in the EU's long term budget. So it's really lovely to be here. And thank you so much to Dr. Elizabeth Klutzer and Dr. Azura Rinaldi for your very insightful and timely presentation. Uh, I'm here tonight representing the European Women's Lobby. We are the largest uh, umbrella organization in Europe representing over 2000 women's associations. And so tonight, I think I will be covering uh, three points, focusing on this absence of a dual approach that I think is so prevalent within the EU's recovery plans, as well as their long-term budget, the multi-annual financial framework, which covers the next seven years. Uh, so these points will include firstly the cuts to the Justice Rights and Values Fund that we have seen, cuts to the European Institute for Gender Equality, AGA, and thirdly the need for gender mainstreaming across all programs. So as a first point, EWL, we are deeply concerned to see that there has been a 20% cut made to the Justice Rights and Values Fund. This is the only fund under the upcoming MFF that is dedicated to the objectives set out in the European Commission's gender equality strategy, including advancing equality between women and men, as well as eliminating all forms of violence against women, against, uh, women and girls. I'd also like to note that to date, the gender equality strategy, which was released earlier this year, has yet to receive any targeted funding. And so with that said, these cuts are really in contradiction to the Commission's political commitments when it comes to implementing gender mainstreaming in all of its activities. These cuts are going to have extremely enormous implications on civil society organizations, including those led by women and feminist organizations who have also been paramount to supporting women and girls during COVID-19. So we've seen their activities in providing legal support to women and girls, providing psychosocial and financial support to victims of domestic violence, as well as homeless women. And given that civil society organizations are operating currently within an increasingly shrinking civic space, access to funds means that it's going to become increasingly difficult over time to get access, which is going to be even more difficult for smaller women's organizations and grassroots organizations. The second point I'd like to touch on, and noting as well that there have been several instances where data has been used tonight, we are extremely worried to see that there is a 45% cut proposed to decentralized agencies, which includes the European Institute for Gender Equality, so AGA. So of our knowledge, AGA receives less than one fifth of the average allocation than any other EU agency. And we must remember that gender equality is not yet a reality in one single country in the EU. So there cannot be any cost cutting exercise when it comes to advancing equality between women and men. We also note that the recent vote made between the European Parliament calling on the Commission to conduct a feasibility study looking at potentially merging AGA with the Fundamental Rights Agency is extremely concerning. This has given AGA's expertise when it comes to gender equality and gender mainstreaming, as well as leading on collecting very invaluable sex disaggregated data that we've seen through COVID-19, looking at the intersection of gender equality and the impacts, as well as the gender equality index, which we use to measure the progress of equality across member states. Our last concern is on the lack of gender mainstreaming used throughout the Commission's proposal and the absence of measures when it comes to eliminating inequalities between women and men, notably seen through the lack of targeted solutions when we're talking about women's unpaid care work. 
To give an overview, I'd like to recall that the EU has been inconsistent when applying gender mainstreaming across its EU funds and its programs. So in 2019, ACA, for example, found that of the EU structural and investment funds, less than 1% was allocated to gender equality specific measures. I'd also like to recall that the European Court of Auditors is currently examining the current MFF to assess whether the EU budget is promoting equality between women and men. And so when moving forward, if the EU would really like to move towards a green and digital Europe, we stress the need to incorporate a gender mainstreaming approach from the design stage to the implementation phase, tied in with the use of sex disaggregated data with gender impact assessments and taking into account the experiences of all women, women with disabilities, Roma women, older women, women of color, looking into the impacts of unpaid care work and also how to enhance the participation of women who are at risk or are already living in poverty. In sum, I would therefore really take this opportunity to call on EU decision makers and MEPs present today to remedy three particular points. The first would be to redress the cuts that have been made to the Justice Rights and Values Fund as an absolute minimum, investing in targeted measures that promote equality between women and men, eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls, and investing in sectors that have been hit hardest through COVID, including the care sector. The second point would be for the EU to ensure there is sustained financing to AGA by redressing these cuts to decentralized agencies as an absolute minimum and ensuring AGA's ongoing independent work when it comes to advancing equality between women and men as a standalone objective. And the third would be to ensure a gender mainstreaming approach when it comes to all funding areas, including taking on a gender budgeting lens that sets clear objectives, targets and indicators across all funds. Really now is the time for the EU to step up and ensure that your funds mirror your political priorities. It cannot turn its back on equality between women and men and we have to come out of this crisis together. So thank you so much for having me tonight. Thanks a lot, Jessica, for being with us. <clears throat> so you ask MEPs um, to fight for the three points you mentioned, and I think we have to start with Next Generation EU, make sure that there are enough funds for women. And I hope to have a person on my side from the EPP, the Minister in Ireland, Frances Fitzgerald, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, lovely to see so many people here. And I have to admit, I've been getting madder and madder uh, while I've been listening to this, which isn't really very useful. You've got to get even. You can't get madder. I do know that. Um, Alexandra, thank you very much for the work that you've done and the petition and to our researchers. It's fantastic to have this sort of detailed research on these issues. And we have a very serious problem facing us, actually. I mean, we have a gender balance commission for the first time. We have a president who's female. We have a new gender equality strategy with a commitment, and I quote from it, uh, from a reply from Helen Daly. The Commission shares the view of the European Parliament that the response to the coronavirus pandemic should mainstream gender equality concerns. And what's very clear from a number of reports, this report tonight, uh, the Research Council's report, which I was doing a webinar on this morning, and my own report, which is still at draft stage on the impact of COVID on women with a range of recommendations in this area. Um, those three reports alone, and I stress the one for FAM is, a, is just at a bit, hopefully shortly will be at amendment stage. Um, we are really seeing that effectively, we are fighting to have gender named and included. And that is a very, very disappointing and serious issue at this particular point. So what we have to do is do everything possible to remedy this going forward. We have enough evidence. I mean, the evidence base in relation to COVID-19 and, and women and men generally is at a very early stage. So I think we're going to have to look at this as sort of, you know, uh, immediate, medium and longer term. And we're going to have to reassess the data as we go forward. But the question is at this point, what can we do to make a difference now in relation to what is the biggest fund that the EU has ever had. And yet we have effectively almost no mention of gender. So this is a very serious political issue. It's a very serious equality issue. And I, you know, we have to look at all the different mechanisms that we need to use. 
uh, quite a few of the specifics have been mentioned you know by Jessica I totally agree with what she had to say and by our two researchers and I, I really think it's a great report because you know that point about the differential impact for example on occupations that is so important I think one of the issues is that some of the inequalities that have been highlighted by COVID are effectively the ones we've always known about but they've got a greater emphasis and more visibility and you could say as Alexandra said at the beginning um, people have been more appreciative of all of those areas and that work but how do you turn that in to a real economic bonus and recovery for women is the challenge we're faced with now and I think in terms of presentation and the research has touched on this one of the first points I would make that it can't be presented as something you're doing. Now, look, we know there are vulnerabilities in women, we know there are gender vulnerabilities, but it actually has to be presented as this is what our, our member states need in order to have an economic resilient package going forward. So it's an economic imperative, and we have the very good statistics on that. But it is extraordinary. I mean, I have to say this, it is extraordinary that we are still having policies that are not based on gender disaggregated data. And it's the same as the research. The research has to be gender disaggregated because we're seeing in medicine, we're seeing in economics, we're seeing everywhere, that if you don't approach it from a gender disaggregated approach, that you will get this kind of thing happening. So that's the first very big ask going forward in all of these funds. And I think we have to bring together European synergies and national synergies because a lot of this money is obviously going to member states. So I think we have an opportunity now that even if it hasn't been dealt with as effectively as it has been at a European level, we could at a member state implementation level have a series of demands about inclusion of gender. And I think it's important to name those. So uh, that's the first kind of the, the really important point. So that the member states and we've got IGA and other people helping with this, they need to gather sex and age disaggregated data on COVID-19 and its impact and in the recovery. So that is the first really important point. Um, the second point I would make is that we need to go through the funds, each of them. And very briefly, because I only have three minutes, I want to pick out three. So you look at the recovery and resilience uh, uh, facility. That's the first one. Um, we can't make progress on this without taking into account women and their participation in the economy as well as the impact of the crisis regional and sectoral uh, dimensions so in this uh, fund there's a great opportunity for women's digital participation for example uh, to be boosted with new opportunities if we look at a second fund the recovery assistance for cohesion and the territories of europe the react eu i think we can look at measures for smes for labour market employment, uh, healthcare employment, complementary to cohesion policy support, taking into account the gender dimension, or perhaps introduce a dedicated programme there. Uh, that could be very important, or a priority sort of axle or, 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 or sector there. And the cohesion policy does and can target policies aiming at women. So we can support entrepreneurship, for example, uh, access to infrastructure, very important after what's happening. And I think the third area is the EU health programme, that we can uh, insist uh, that we have dedicate specific research on the impact of the pandemic on gender, uh, tackle key issues, for example, such as sex differences in Im immune responses, uh, sex specific effects of vaccines and therapeutics, a gender specific risks, for example, because we have so many women out there on the front line, over 80% across Europe, 82% of cashiers, for example, in supermarkets, and gender sensitive prevention campaigns, as well as the gender specific socioeconomic burdens of public safety measures. So, I mean, that's only a, you know, a very quick indication of the kind of areas um, where we need to see very specific initiatives but the big problem we have is that we have arrived at a stage in 2020 where gender is missing specifically from the biggest recovery fund uh, that has ever come out of the eu and how do we work together to uh, create awareness about this because there's no awareness 
and the awareness is still in specific reports. So how do we create awareness across the parliament around this? How do we demand that it's included going forward? And how do we make sure that it's implemented in member states? So it's quite a big political uh, a task actually uh, to really get the information out about this. I mean, I've raised it with Ursula at a meeting she was at that I, that I was at. I didn't actually get a detailed response. Um, I do think we need to lobby the commissioners and the council uh, going forward. And we have to make sure that Helen Daly's work is taken seriously. Because I think what's happened is that you're getting a focus on the macroeconomic, the macro health, and you're not getting uh, the gender. And this is so important with COVID because it does have uh, differential uh, impacts on gender. And going forward, there'll be a differential socioeconomic. Um, uh, there's a great opportunity here, uh, but the problem is that it may escalate uh, inequalities rather than reduce them. So there are my concerns around it. But Alexandra, thanks again for organising this. It's um, I think it's really important and, and well done on your initiative. Thank you very much. That was a very dense three minutes and I'm really looking forward to working with you. I think if we put all our proposals together, we will change something. And you're perfectly right about the need to raise awareness. Um, that's what we are trying to do. Actually, that's what I tried to do with the petition. And I think we reached some people um, because it was important. If I, if I can just briefly comment on that, it was important in the beginning also to raise awareness among women. Because what I feel a little bit is that often women look at the women's programs, like the rights and value programs and domestic violence, typically female sectors, sort of, and, um, and forget, also forget about the big thing, which is other macroeconomic aspects and where the, where the big money is going. So it's very important to take care of domestic violence and, and to get the money back to Iger and the rights and values programs. But what I always say, you know, women who have their own income and their own apartment and their own house, they don't suffer from domestic violence usually. They just walk out and they have their own money. They're less dependent and less prone to those kinds of problems. So I think we have to really tackle the root causes of the problems. And um, this is where the money is. So we have to focus on the big funds and on the macroeconomic aspects. And this is what I'm trying to create, aw create awareness for. Because we first, ha I think, have to have a strong women's movement and a strong consensus among women that this is necessary. And then we are able to get the men on board when they feel there's really enough pressure to get the commission and the member states on board. And we're really looking forward to doing this together. And um, so let's go on with other people. I would like to work together in the parliament. And I've already been working together. Pina, I introduced you before. Um, before you came in, I said you're doing a great job in Italy um, to disseminate the petition. You got a lot of hate speech as well. And um, I really appreciate that. And you have the floor now from your point of view. Ecco, mi sentite? Non so se uh, funziona la traduzione, spero di sì. Uh, fatemi un cenno, funziona la traduzione? Mi sentite bene? Ok. Uh, allora, intanto grazie, grazie davvero Alessandra. Io mi scuso perché sono arrivata un po' in ritardo, avevo avvisato, ma uh, sono giornate molto dense di incontri e di, di riunioni. In Italia ci sono anche le elezioni regionali, quindi insomma ci stiamo anche lì impegnando per rendere le donne protagoniste di questi appuntamenti, ma ci tenevo moltissimo ad essere qui con voi stasera eh, per condividere un po' il senso di questa battaglia che stiamo facendo insieme, che facciamo nelle aule del Parlamento europeo, nelle commissioni in cui ciascuna di noi eh, lavora, vedo delle colleghe che come me sono nella commissione FAM che si occupa appunto di diritti e di uguaglianza eh, delle donne e che comunque abbiamo eh, con le quali ci siamo ritrovate ehm, per questa battaglia eh, eh, per appunto la petizione in ciascuno dei, dei nostri paesi. Allora, lo avete detto, io riprendo il concetto, sono state dette molte cose importanti e interessanti. Eh, la pandemia, il coronavirus ha evidenziato delle debolezze strutturali dei nostri paesi, dei nostri stati membri. È stata un po' una cartina di tornasole per rendere evidente evidenti quelle debolezze che in qualche per esasperare quelle debolezze che esistevano già 
evidentemente. Quando sottolineiamo come le crisi colpiscono più duramente le categorie più deboli, come anche questa crisi ha colpito in maniera più dura, più, eh, come dire, ha avuto uno, come dire, un atteggiamento più aggressivo nei confronti delle categorie più deboli, quindi i precari e quindi le donne, sottolineiamo, e altre categorie naturalmente che ho già esposte socialmente, sottolineiamo un dato che c'era già evidente, insomma un dato come dire, che accomuna tutte quante le crisi. E per questo noi stiamo provando a reagire con eh, tutta la forza che abbiamo per eh, far capire che cosa, che se questo è il momento in cui eh, occorre ridisegnare i nostri paesi, e occorre ridisegnare i nostri stati membri perché appunto c'è una grande iniezione di denaro pubblico eh, e c'è una grande opportunità, opportunità che deriva dal lavoro che la Commissione sta facendo, allora questa ricostruzione va fatta a partire dalle debolezze strutturali dei nostri paesi, dalle fratture sociali che ci portiamo dietro da un sacco di tempo. E allora è evidente che la distanza dei, tra i generi, come è stato detto, diventa uno degli elementi su cui investire con maggior forza. Mi è piaciuta molto la suggestione che ha, lancia, che ha lanciato uh, Franz Fitzgerald a proposito della politica di coesione, che io riprendo con molta convinzione. Cioè se la politica di coesione è stato in, altri, in un altro momento storico lo strumento illuminato attraverso il quale ridurre le distanze tra gli stati membri, tra chi era più avanti, tra le economie più forti e le economie più deboli, allora questo è il momento in cui noi dobbiamo strutturare una politica della coesione di genere. Mi convince moltissimo questo aspetto Alessandra, perché questa è esattamente la battaglia che noi dobbiamo fare, ognuna naturalmente per il ruolo che ha, richiamando a questa responsabilità tutti gli attori del dibattito pubblico e quindi i ricercatori e quindi i giornalisti e quindi gli attori del dibattito pubblico che sono responsabili della parola pubblica perché su questo e anche sulla distanza del genere voi lo sapete benissimo eh, la a, azzurra eh, respira come me eh, e Alessandra conosce appunto il clima il substrato culturale che in Italia molto spesso si respira ma che purtroppo è comune in molti stati membri quando si parla di donne e quando si parla di investimenti eh, macroeconomico e quindi del valore economico che deriva dall'investimento sulle politiche del lavoro, sulle politiche di genere, ti guardano sempre con un'aria che quando va bene è di sufficienza e quando va male ti dicono che racconti delle bugie. Io, Alessandra conosce bene eh, quello che è successo in Italia quando io ho diffuso la petizione Half of It. Mi è stato detto che, io, che noi volevamo e chiedevamo di investire in centri benessere in corsi di uncinetto. Questo mi è stato detto quando noi abbiamo chiesto, pretendiamo la, eh, che almeno appunto la metà di questi fondi per il recovery fund vengano spesi anche per politiche di genere, che venga fatto un impatto, una valutazione di genere dei soldi spesi, che vengano introdotti delle misure cogenti. Perché guardate, eh, siamo stanche anche di buone intenzioni io ve lo voglio dire così la politica è sempre piena solo di buone intenzioni quando si parla di donne noi abbiamo bisogno di misure vincolanti e quindi se un'azienda che lavora in settori occupazionali a prevalenza maschile utilizza dei soldi pubblici che sono dei soldi messi a disposizione dai cittadini europei e allora deve essere vincolata a promuovere l'occupazione femminile vincolata perché se noi non introduciamo un vincolo e non ne facciamo una battaglia cogente, come dire, vincolata a degli obiettivi, ancora una volta noi saremo, come dire, subissate e travolte dalle buone intenzioni, ma non riusciremo a portare a casa nessun risultato. Così come dico pure ad Alessandra, che fa un lavoro splendido anche all'interno della Commissione Budget, che io credo che noi dovremmo proporre ai commissari all'interno del dell'MFF un fondo ad hoc per le donne e per l'occupazione perché se, se è vero come è vero che meno del 30% delle donne, questo è un dato che riguarda in maniera drammaticamente uniforme tutta Europa è ritornata al lavoro dopo l'emergenza Covid noi ci stiamo preparando ad un'espulsione graduale ma inesorabile 
delle donne dal mercato del lavoro in Europa. E questo è intollerabile. Allora, questa è un'emergenza su cui noi dobbiamo chiedere un intervento. Eh, come delegazione italiana, le donne appunto ehm, del, 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 eh, del Partito Democratico, del mio partito, noi abbiamo già scritto mesi fa in realtà una lettera al commissario Schmitz per chiedere un impegno in questo senso, non ci è stato nemmeno risposto. Questo lo dico perché è bene avere anche una percezione del lavoro che insieme noi dovremo fare. E quindi bene, io ringrazio moltissimo Alessandra perché eh, questa battaglia noi la, come dire, la vinceremo, riusciremo a vincerla soltanto dandoci repro, recipro, reciprocamente forza, soltanto eh, riconoscendo il valore di una battaglia che deve essere collettiva e che se non è collettiva non riusciremo a vincere quindi eh, come dire io penso che sia arrivato il momento ne abbiamo già parlato con Alessandra in un'altra un occasione in un altro webinar di un ritrovato femminismo che rimetta al centro la necessità di batterci di combattere per una uguaglianza che non sia soltanto di facciata per una uh, un, come dire un riconoscimento uguale di diritti che non è soltanto annunciato ma che viene per davvero praticato e siccome questo è uno degli impegni fondamentali che ha assunto la Presidente von der Leyen quando è stata votata appunto Presidente della Commissione io credo che su questo dovremo insistere con molta molta forza e con molta convinzione grazie Alexandra per il tuo lavoro e per questa occasione di dibattito Grazie Pina e colgo l'occasione riallacciandomi al tuo intervento ehm, di rispondere anche ad un'altra domanda e ripasso all'inglese. So I switch to English, but it's time to change translation. Um, speaking about um, the Commission President von der Leyen, um, there was one question that also said um, Ursula von der Leyen and Sassoli have put much emphasis on gender equality in their opening speeches. Any chances to remind them? and ask them to transfer their commitments to actions regarding gender equality now. Yes, I had the chance, I think 10 days ago, a couple of weeks ago, because the Commission President came into our group for a group meeting and I asked her exactly that question. Um, so what are you going to do on gender equality for the fund? And I'll put, a, put forward all the arguments we're discussing here today and reminded her of her commitments. And, um, and she said, oh, yes, um, you know that this is very dear to my heart, which, which I believe because I'm German and I know what she did in Germany for childcare. And um, yeah, and come and talk to me and let's see what we can do. So far, we haven't had time, but um, just we, we talk about it. So um, I asked to see her, no answer. 10 days passed, um, tried to talk to her cabinet, no way so far. So this is, this is what's happening. This is why we really need a strong movement inside the parliament and outside the parliament. But um, before now, we are starting to have questions um, for the floor as well. But before I would like to give the floor to the last speaker from the MEP who has waited for a long time. Samira, we're very glad to have you and you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, Alexandra. And uh, please allow me uh, to first start with thanking you a lot for this initiative. It's very great, very important that we have this discussion with different groups in the European Parliament. Um, and also thank you uh, to the economists that really highlighted the need for the systematic gender impact assessments and gender mainstreaming more generally, because this is so, so crucial information that we need for our work and also to make sure that we raise the right questions in our own institutions. Um, first of all, I would like to start that, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate that uh, the, the European Commission itself did not yet came with an impact assessment, uh, given the impact of the crisis on women across all sectors and aspects of life. And I think we've seen a very interesting presentation today about the sectors in which women are represented and the focus of the recovery plan uh, when it comes to these sectors. So we, we see, we already see there one of the, the, the problems that we have now. Um, so basically a while ago, we from uh, Renew, but I also know that, uh, that other groups uh, uh, have asked, uh, asked it through other ways. Um, we actually wrote to the commission specifically on, on that issue, just so on the gender uh, impact assessment, um, we still didn't get an answer. Um, and it's very important that we get an answer on how they are going to conduct this impact assessment because also today it is very clear that, that we already see some very negative and crucial consequences for, for women and girls in our society. So, um, and I think in the future what we also learn from this is that 
we need to have gender impact assessments carried out on all EU proposals in general, in all EU policies that we make and produce. So let's not wait for another crisis. We should make it something very systematic and we really need to continue um, to fight for uh, gender budgeting and for a strong, a strong data collection. And not only the, the data collection, like um, Francis uh, said so well, uh, but also we need to invest in tools, in strategies to make sure uh, that our institutions ourselves have, have the right metho methodologies uh, to collect the data. Because we also learned um, that there's also a lack of capacity uh, and a lack of good strategies sometimes to really gather the data. But I'm really happy with, for example, what the IG Institute is already doing and, and uh, on this because they're doing extremely important work. So. That's great. So um, we, we have, of course, seen the, the disproportionate impact of, of the crisis on women. Um, it really strengthened the already existing gender inequality. So it's very important that we emphasize that it was already existing. And now it's even like we, we see it now more clearly, but it's also strengthened. Um, and we, we've seen that it was in the social uh, sectors, in the health sectors, uh, where they are women. So women are the vast majority of workers in, uh, to, to keep helping these essential sectors like education, uh, services. Uh, but we also saw, given the corona crisis, that there is a very uh, serious problem with the access to sexual and reproductive uh, health care and services such as uh, contra, uh, contraception, um, IVF, abortion, they were all hampered uh, with serious consequences for women. And uh, we also, of course, finally saw the, the rise of, uh, of, of victims of domestic violence. So um, this is further, further evidenced already by IGA, by UN Women. They've all already started with collecting this, this data when it comes to the gendered impact of the crisis. Um, so it is therefore also my opinion that it is extremely disappointing that uh, women are barely mentioned in the recovery plan for Europe. I literally did control F. I, I literally did the search option to count how, how, how many women and gender uh, I saw in the recovery plan. And uh, I think you were not surprised that I was extremely uh, disappointed by that. So I was also raising the questions like, but we have like, you know, we have women in the European Commission. There, there is kind of a good gender balance, you could say, almost like 50%. So how come that we, st that we are still missing out? So I'm really curious about who was involved in the decision-making process and, and who raised the right, question, uh, the right questions based on what kind of data? Um, so, um, I think, I think we, we really need to make the statement that, um, we, we do not, we do not find it acceptable that we don't see clear targeted gender measures or dedicated funds to address the specific needs of women, um, in this, this plan. And we, we really need to, it, it's not in line with either the dual approach or the cross-cutting principles of the new gender equality strategy. So Europe really needs to put its money where its mouth is. That, that would also be my statement, to really show commitment to equality and gender equality is specific. And I think we cannot speak of the EU's next generation without addressing the needs of women and girls. So without targeted actions or dedicated funds, at the very least, we need, um, uh, we need that to be stronger. We need a stronger gender perspective, more gender mainstreaming requirements across all three pillars of the next generation instrument and in the revised and reinforced long term budget for the next seven years. Because like I said, it's, it's, it shouldn't be depending on only a crisis. It should be long term. It should be systematic. And particularly, we need to focus on the just uh, transition mechanism and the new health program. That's, that's the EU for health. A program because that is really an opportunity to ensure um, access to SRHR um, and, and we've seen that uh, that there are so many difficulties right now because of the crisis. So the Commission and Member States, they must ensure that they use the opportunity of the recovery and leverage these instruments to address and eradicate gender inequalities. Um, 
specific uh, enable also the conditions on gender equality as proposed in the new common provisions regulation and to have also in place a national gender equality strategic framework as a precondition to make use of the funds that should be included in the recovery package. And there's also a very crucial responsibility of the member states. Um, then my point about the civil society organizations, um, um, they should be representing women well, therefore they need to be uh, fully included in the leadership and decision-making process for member states, uh, given the COVID-19 responses and the recovery planning. Um, there should be uh, task forces with stakeholders and representatives from women's organizations that should be activated for the purpose to ensure that they are involved in shaping of decisions and to ensure gender mainstreaming. And we've seen some great examples coming from Italy. Um, and in this regard, we knew Europe and, and also some other groups and members in the European Parliament, uh, they tabled written questions for, for debate to uh, the plenary to call on the council to create a council configuration for EU ministers of gender equality. So like that's like a council of EU ministers and people and high pro profile pe uh, persons that are responsible for gender equality. So um, I think this task force is really needed so that we can monitor and that we can control and that we can gender mainstream. And then my last point would be about trade. Um, I know that also this is something that we share as groups in the parliament. Um, and we see that less than 40% of the jobs are generated by, generated by international trade are filled by women um, or well, basically said women do not profit enough through international trade and the trade agreements. Um, we have these, these numbers and statistics and examples now. It is very important that given the economic position that uh, for the future trade agreements, we make sure that there are gender and trade chapters um, that can really strengthen the economic position of women. Um, and in its next generation EU communication, the European Commission stated that Trade will remain a fundamental growth engine and they will be essential, it, it will be essential for the Europe's recovery. Um, and the European Commission is completely right in this regard, but I think it's also an example of, again, not taking into account all the very small crucial pieces, uh, because, you know, here we go again with the gender mainstreaming. We should also take into account then that um, we need a gender and trade chapter. Um, so, this will be my last statements and um thank you okay thank you a lot for being here and um sorry for apologize for stopping you but we are already supposed to have concluded and we definitely haven't i just would like to say one thing um it's very good to have the list of all the things that the commission should be doing in this moment but the commission has already made a choice and it has chosen to leave women out and to give the parliament very, very little power to change that. And we have to harness all the power we have left to make a change and to create majorities in our groups, because the problem will be to get a majority for all these, these great measures and great plans in, in our groups. What my group leadership is saying that they are trying to figure out what kind of conditionalities we'll be able to put into the recovery and resilience facility, which we hear now is the biggest one for everybody outside parliament. That's really the, the huge share of the money. And they are telling me, well, for climate, there's a chance on gender, everybody else said no. So I think it's a hard battle we have in front of us. I think we can take another five minutes. Um, there were two people from the attendees who had raised their hands, but I'm not seeing their hands raised anymore. I don't know whether I had to leave because it's late. Um, if they want to speak, especially Marion, who had a lot of, okay, here I am, Eva. I uh, will give her the floor. And I saw Marion had a lot of written questions. We were not able to answer all. So if you want to speak, um, please raise your hand. Eva, you have the floor. You have to ask yeah. me with yourself. Can you hear me? Everything okay? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I can have Deutsch right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, ich glaube, in diesen ganzen Geldern, die reserviert worden sind jetzt für die Post-Covid-Geschichte, ist ein Punkt bis jetzt noch etwas übersehen 
was vor allem Frauenleben und Frauenkarrieren betrifft. Und das ist das ganze Problem mit der Digitalisierung. Die großen Investments, die hier geplant sind, werden in ganz großem Ausmaß Verwaltungsaufgaben wegrationalisieren, sei es in Banken, sei es in Reisebüros, sei es in der öffentlichen Verwaltung. Und wen trifft das? Das trifft Frauen, Aufsteigerinnen sehr oft. Ich glaube, dass es sehr wertvoll wäre, wenn wir versuchen würden, einen Teil unserer Energie auch dafür zu verwenden, zu schauen, dass wir dieses Thema Digitalisierung und wohin geht sie und wen kostet sie die Jobs und welche Maßnahmen können getroffen werden, besser in den Griff zu kriegen. Das wird aus meiner Sicht bis jetzt ziemlich übersehen, denn schon im Rest denkt man nur an Straßenbau, also die alten Rezepte, das sind alles Männerdinger und äh, alles das, was sozusagen im Hintergrund dann läuft, wird übersehen. Also ich würde, ich würde bitten darum, dass man gerade in diesem Bereich Digitalisierung sehr genau hinsieht, auf Kosten welcher Jobs das geht und ob äh, hier wirklich die Investitionen das bringen, was, wir, was erwartet wird, was sie bringen. Danke. Ja, yeah. uh, vielen, vielen Dank, Eva. Um, that, that was, I think, a very um, valuable uh, contribution and it's totally true. Um, I work in digital policy and I'm very interested in this topic that you brought up. Um, the, the issue that administrative tasks being automated is something that hits women's jobs mainly and even well-paid women's jobs. So that's, that's very important and it's very interesting to see that I brought this issue up with the commission already last year when they were still preparing the white paper on artificial intelligence, with us, which is something I work on. And there's nothing in the white paper on the employment impact. And I, I talked about it with them and they were like, oh, well, you know, it's not, it's member states competence, employment, who cares, sort of. It was quite disappointing and I think we really have a point there and we have to look at the employment impact and especially as the gendered employment impact of automization and digitalization. So, but now I have Marion as well. Marion, come in briefly, please. I know you have an enormous amount of things to say, but if you could try to be brief, very, very happy. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, um, thank you for all your work and the presentation, Elizabeth and uh, where is she? <laughs> Asura, and um, to everybody. I won't repeat what I wrote in the chat. Um, I hope you can fight. I hope you can really find some areas where they can introduce criteria and objectives and indicators. So they have to uh, confess, they have to, I mean, offer something you should talk about how many women are there in Europe. I hope the petition will gain some more uh, signatures. It's really a pity that such less women, I think, have signed there. Um, it's, it's not a good picture of our power. But uh, as, as, I, as a second red line, I think if it comes to worse to worse and they don't, um, you can't uh, negotiate uh, some changes, then I think there's another strategy. You could open a uh, lots of hearing good information, for example, about the uh, funds of digitalization to make women aware, just go and, uh, you know, claim these funds. And I talked to many of the scientists in, uh, for example, uh, virology and in the charity in uh, Berlin, Humboldt University, I have friends among them. And they don't know. They said, ah, there will be money in the EU for this digitalization. I'm, I'm doing research there. I'm using digitalization for to fight Corona crisis uh, in their professions. And, you know, they, they are um, more eager to go to big companies like VW funds or any other big funds to raise this uh, um, money for the research instead of going to the EU. Show open doors, show them where to go, call us in the parliament, call, make regional parliamentary meetings and show the women how to get this money out there. I, this is just, I think it's a bottom line strategy, it's not what I want. Uh, I think really, I hope uh, you, you can reach whatever is possible, so good luck. Thank you, Marion. Uh, we'll, we'll need it, I think, and we need all your support. 
um, there is um, there is a written question from from Gea um, to who I say hi, who says, um, do you expect there will be a swift consensus on the EU recovery and fund proposal, and what would you suggest for advocacy and awareness rising in July and beyond? And I think that's really. Um, um, a remark on which we could um, come to a conclusion and which also has a link to what, what Marion said and a few previous speakers said. Um, I don't know. I think nobody of us really um, has the glass sphere, the crystal sphere to say, will there be an agreement in, at the European Council in July or not? My, my gut feeling is yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I might be wrong. I don't know what my, my colleagues from the parliament think about that or whether they have any news. Um, I think there might be an agreement. There might also not be an agreement. Nobody knows. But I have the feeling everybody wants this um, to be concluded very quickly. Because especially I, I think, uh, Alexandra, I, I think it's likely, but I think the big discussion is going to be the balance between uh, you know loans and for, uh, loans and uh, grants, yes. and um, I, I think that's where the, the the kind of cutting edge decision will be. Hard to get gender in there, I imagine, in any way. Um, but um, I, you know, I would expect that from a solidarity point of view. I mean, the expectation clearly would be that you know if there isn't an agreement, it's very serious. I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's absolutely true. I absolutely agree. And the Greens in Germany um, fought a big battle to, um, to change the German government's position and to have this solidarity fund that is funded by all European countries and that doesn't leave only the southern European countries and those countries with huge debt um, to sort out all the problems and um, to, to still have a, a solid uh, a European Union that really is tied together and it stays together. So this is a great success. But at the same time, it's, it's really sad that we fight against inequalities between European countries, but the gender inequality is not even mentioned at these, at these summits. And this is really something we have to change. Um, there are many other questions, but I think we're really running out of time. I'm supposed to be in another meeting since um, I've been supposed to be there 10 minutes ago. Um, is there anybody who really wants to make an important conclusive remark? Otherwise, I will. Looking at all of you. Okay. Um, so, how to go on? Um, I think we have to get back to the idea to call to involve all the movements, the women's associations, everybody who can fight for this to create awareness over the summer. I think this is this is a huge task, but it's important to do that because in politics we need the support of civil society. And if our fellow politicians don't feel the heat coming, they won't be in favor of this. Pina already described what happens in Italy if you bring up the gender issue. And it's it's like that everywhere. It's not only Italy. Um, I think in many of the political groups we're working in, we have the thing um, that we are a minority, not in mine, fortunately, but we still have to fight to show there is a link between macroeconomic aspects and gender equality. And it's going to be a hard battle and we need, we, we need all the support everybody can give us. We need to stay together in Parliament. I think we need to create a women's network in Parliament to know of each other what we are doing. Um, was great to hear from about France's report, um, for example. I didn't know that was going on. I noticed the Farm Committee hadn't even asked for an opinion on the RRF and I was quite surprised, but I realized how important it is to work together as, as, a, as a women's network to share information, to share arguments, to share research, and to try to push in the, in the same direction. I still have a, a long list of measures we could take in Parliament, things we could do together on the single funds in order to improve them. Table amendments, which is our job in Parliament, um, and I think we'll have to talk about this in the next weeks before the summer break in order to, um, to agree on, on a common strategy, because if we are divided by political lines, we will not achieve anything. We really have to, to work together and to, do, to build a strong, a strong network of women to push for, 
for our concerns, for our important goals for gender equality in this decisive moment. Um, so uh, many people have asked uh, for the slides, um, for the studies, <laughs> and we will be happy to circulate it. We are um, sort of finishing the last, uh, the layout of the study, but we're able tomorrow to circulate the executive summaries and in the next days, I think the whole study. Not sure about the slides, we have to ask the authors, obviously, for permission. We will do that. Um, and um, looking at my notes because I had all these important things to say, but I'm really running out of time. So I would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank um, the speakers. I would like to thank the interpreters because I think it's really important to do these seminars in different languages, not only in English. So to allow people out of the bubbles, uh, the Brussels bubbles to participate in the language. Oh, thanks a lot for making this possible. I know there's still a lot of open questions, um, but maybe we can follow up the discussion on Twitter. Please share the petition, half of it, sign it, get the people you know to share it and to push it. There are a, a series of important and interesting suggestions in there. Uh, follow us on our social media channels. We will keep communicating about all these uh, initiatives. And you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording in the following days. So please stay healthy. We keep you posted and keep fighting for women's rights. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.